Hello, human geographers. We are back at it again this evening. Tonight, we are going to look at the economic influences of agricultural practices. Let's start by recalling that generally, commercial agriculture has larger farm sizes than subsistence. But within commercial agriculture, there are major differences between the very large commercial farms and the smaller family farms. Family farms represent most farms worldwide, but many of these farms are subsistence farms located in the developing world like Asia or Africa. 84% of farms worldwide are smaller than five acres, and these small farms operate about 12% of the total farmland. That means approximately 16% of farms worldwide are larger than five acres and represent 88% of the world's farmland. So let's take a look at the United States, for example. We've seen that the number of farms have been declining, while the size of farms have been getting bigger. Competition to generate the maximum profit has led to a decline in those small family farms. That land is then bought and consolidated into larger corporate-run farms, often run by people who don't even live on the land they're working. And while many farms in the United States are still small family-run commercial farms, they only represent about 20% of the total production. Most of the agricultural goods that are produced are coming from the largest farms. We see on the graphic here that that is true for hogs and most of the chicken supply in the United States is handled by just six very large corporations such as Tyson and Purdue. And large scale commercial agriculture in MDCs as well as plantation agriculture in LDCs are driving many smaller family farms out of business. Some of the smaller farmers remain in the area to work as low-wage, landless agricultural laborers, but many more move from rural areas to urban areas. Add to this fact that many family farmers are getting older without a younger generation to replace them. All of these elements are leading to the greater influence of large, corporate-controlled, vertically integrated agribusiness operations. Agribusiness is commercial agriculture characterized by the integration of different steps in the food processing industry, usually through ownership by large corporations. So far, we've talked about agriculture as a primary sector activity. Agribusinesses, though, don't focus solely on the farm and primary sector, but rather incorporate multiple steps from processing and production, transportation, marketing, retail, even research and development. So we might see the raw food harvested, but then processed, shipped, and marketed all by a single company. We also see agribusinesses doing their own in-house research into genetic modification as well. One example is the herbicide-resistant Roundup Ready GMO seeds. The agribusiness Monsanto is not just involved in the primary sector, but also in the secondary, tertiary, and quaternary levels. And when a single company controls all those different steps from extraction to sales, it is known as vertical integration. This helps improve the efficiencies of commercial agriculture and thereby increase profits by reducing cost. These large agribusinesses are often transnational corporations and have access to tremendous capital 
So they will invest money to buy the latest technology from huge mechanized combines, harvesters, and milking machines to computer systems, lasers for guiding plows and field leveling, drones for soil and field analysis, as well as GPS systems. And because of the highly mechanized nature of agribusiness, along with the fact that many are vertically integrated and include fleets of trucks for shipping, agribusinesses depend heavily on fossil fuels. But these expensive inputs generate greater production and thus greater profits. But their income doesn't purely come from profits from agricultural sales. Agribusinesses also benefit from subsidies, which are a government payment that supports a business or market. The U.S. government pays out about $20 billion annually in farm subsidies. In fact, one study revealed that the largest 15% of farm operations receive 85% of the subsidies. This further contributes to the continuing growth of a limited number of agribusinesses while smaller family farms go out of business. One of the reasons that agribusinesses are so profitable is because of their efficient transportation systems. And when examining the transportation of agriculture, we have to talk about commodity chains. A commodity chain is a series of links connecting a commodity's places of production, distribution, and consumption. These links or connections benefit larger corporate farms more than smaller family farms. Essentially, these commodity chains are the processes that get a chicken or coffee or rice or milk from the farm to your grocery store or plate. The vertical integration of agribusinesses makes this process more efficient for them than for smaller farmers. And while the commodities move from producer to consumer, the money flows in the opposite direction from consumer back to the producer, with each step in that chain receiving a portion of the profits. And commodity chains can get incredibly complex with many steps in the process from farm to table. For example, corn has numerous uses, such as livestock feed, sweeteners, and fuel. And the commodity chain for each would be more specialized and complex than the one you see on the screen. For another example, processes that add value to a commodity, such as dairy milk being processed into cheese or ice cream, adds additional steps and complexity to the commodity chain. And while we're talking about milk and dairy products, let's make sure we mention cool chains. A cool chain is a system that uses refrigeration and food freezing technologies to keep farm produce fresh in climate controlled environments at every stage of transport from field to retail grocers and restaurants. This allows commodities to not only travel from one part of a country to another, but across the world, opening up more markets for potentially greater profits. The expansion of markets, the reality that agribusinesses can sell to consumers all over the world has changed the nature of agriculture, as we will examine in future lectures. But perhaps one of the biggest advantages that agribusinesses have is their ab ability to produce a much higher volume of agricultural goods. The larger amounts of produce creates what are known as economies of scale, which is the cost advantages that can come with a larger scale of operations. Basically, an economy of scale says that if you produce a lot of one thing, in this case, you produce a lot of a particular crop, then the average cost of production declines. 
This is achieved through efficiencies in mechanization, transportation, computerized production, and the enlarging of land under cultivation. That increased efficiency reduces the amount of labor or energy that it takes to produce each unit, thereby driving down costs and increasing profits. And it doesn't just benefit the producers. The reduction in cost can drive down the price that consumers pay to buy the product. The Green Revolution further accelerated farms toward greater economies of scale as synthetic fertilizers, herbicides, and pesticides reduced loss and increased production. Genetically modified seeds could be grown closer together, intensifying land already under cultivation. This increase in production led to an increase in the global carrying capacity. And while agribusinesses have a benefit over smaller family-run farms because they have the capital to invest in all of these technologies, smaller farms have found ways to benefit from economies of scale as well. Smaller farms may join together in what is called a cooperative so that they can share equipment or buy seeds in bulk, thereby reducing their costs. Another element associated with economies of scale are feedlots, which is a plot of land on which livestock are fattened for market. The global expansion of fast food operations along with just the general increase in demand for meat, has led to increased animal production. Large ranching operations exist in the United States, but have expanded to areas like South America as well. As more meat is consumed, more cattle need to be raised faster, which has given rise to confined animal feeding operations, or CAFOs, or CAFOs. CAFOs are confined spaces where cattle or hogs have limited movement and thus gain weight faster. This also represents an intensification of what has traditionally been a more extensive system of livestock ranching. Because animals are held in higher density and especially higher concentration settings, feedlots have utilized more vaccines and antibiotics to combat the spread of disease. Hormones are often given to animals to help them gain weight faster. And this has supported economies of scale for the meat packing industry as farmers can raise more animals in a shorter time with less space, which in turn helps to maximize profits. And that is where we will end tonight. Have a wonderful evening, everyone, and I'll see you back in class.